Okay, let's go ahead now and let's just get a clean a clean sheet and we're going to unpack significances now. We'll use the same colors, but now we're focusing on um, our analyses and we're focusing on specifically uh, significance, significances in the text. We've already highlighted, we've already highlighted the you and the therefore, and then also this, this relationship. So we won't really unpack that. Let's focus now on this being strengthened. This is, this is a, we already highlighted that this is a, a command. So what are the significances here? Number one, I want to say is that I really think strongly that when we study this word, I think that this, this be strengthened, I don't think it's you strengthen yourself, especially with throughout Paul's gospel of dependence upon the spirit. If we come back up to, let's, let's come back up to the preceding context here. If we come back up to here, we have uh, in Timothy's testimony, we have in Timothy's testimony, we have the gift of God, the spirit, this faith that's living inside of him, this, this holy calling because of God's purpose. So we have this, What's going on here, big idea here, let's just write this down here, is this big idea of sovereignty of God in, 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 in Timothy's life Paul, and also Paul. So we have this, this sovereignty of God aspect. So coming down to here, I just, I can't contextually, I just don't think it's appropriate to see this as a middle, focus, middle active voice focusing on on Timothy doing this, I think this is a this is this is a passive. So number one, this is passive. And so then the implication here is that this is God's work in Timothy's life. Be strengthened. All right. Allow allow yourself to be strengthened. And so then if we're if we're understanding the sense as allowing God to, so we could write this actively, allow God to strengthen you. Okay. So, so that's the active, if we were to rewrite it in, a, in an active sense. And so obviously the, the significance here then is number four and most fundamentally spirit led dependence which we've seen in the preceding context. Okay, spirit-led dependence. All right. And and so how do we do this, right? Or what's the what's the means by which we do this? And so then we've already highlighted so we if coming back to this to our discussion here, we've already highlighted that it is a it's it's the means, right? So We've already highlighted that it's the means. So then coming back here, this is the means and the accents on grace, right? So so how how do we allow this as for, so so Timothy is a leader and a pastor. Timothy is a pastor. How does he the question is how? How does he allow himself to do this? And so this is where we can speak about the means of grace and li literally means of grace, connecting these two here, literally means of grace. So, so the answer is means of grace concerning and concerning fundamental. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to list out things that we should be doing as pastors and leaders. And I think to, Paul was calling upon uh, Timothy to do. So so fundamentally, the means of grace, the, the, the answer would be 
the word and sacraments or ordinances. I know that sacrament is pejorative in Baptist Pentecostal circles. We're not using it in a Catholic sense. So Catholics use other words that we we both use. We use Jesus Christ. We use holy. We use <laughs> we use Eucharist. We use a lot of uh, parallel words. So in, in using sacrament, we're not using it in a Catholic sense. We're using it in a Protestant biblical sense. Okay. So we could say sacraments, or if you don't like that word, you could use ordinance, ordinances. And and so that would be comprehensive, but let's let's break this down further. Okay. So and I don't I don't think this is outside of the purview. So I have a list of items that are fundamental to us. And so what we're essentially saying is how does Timothy allow himself to be strengthened? by the spirit. Okay. So are we just going to sit there and not do anything and just wait? Or are there things that we can be doing to prepare ourselves? And it's not preparing ourselves as if we're going to be doing things acceptable in God's sight, but it's in the sense of how do we allow God's spirit to strengthen us? What are some things that we can do? And I, and I think as we draw out this, as we draw out, um, as we highlight these things, I think it'll really become aware that really this is the work of the spirit and we're just allowing the spirit to work. So so tweaking these things out. And so I think that all of these things that I'm going to list are in some way connected with the word or the sacraments or the sacraments or the ordinances. So fundamentally as a pastor, what Timothy needs to be doing is there needs to be this idea of, of hearing the word, most fundamental, hearing the word. And when I say that, I'm saying it in a... The, the hearing in a Shema sense that you that you listen to it, you receive it, you 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 accept its knowledge, and then you obey it. So as a pastor for Timothy, as a leader, as someone who's going to equip others, number one, we need to allow the word to be heard, received, learned, and then we, we need to obey it. Fundamental as a pastor. And so this is where we need to be having personal worship and devotions on a, on a, on a regular basis, not this type a rushing to do things next. We next, we need to in, in hearing the word, obviously, and maybe this is more fundamental. I don't think there's, I think it's, it's a both. And we need to be living a life of faith or dependence. And so you say, well, maybe this is, this is more of a mindset. What do you mean by that, Tim? What I mean by that is, is we can be living as if everything depended upon us as leaders, right? So everything literally depends on us and we, we micromanage and we, and we work 80 hours a week. Living a life of faith and dependence is recognizing that we're not going to get to everything. We're going to leave the rest to God and allow God to work things out in the end. And so this is a way for us to prepare the spirit to lead us and to strengthen us by allowing to actually letting go and letting God God's sovereign will be done because we can't control everything. Uh, something else that's fundamental to this, and this is con con connected with the hearing of the word, is allowing the word to speak to us and for us to confess and repent. And a lot of pastors, you'll never see them repent in front of anyone else. They'll never ask for forgiveness of their sins. And that's wrong. The Christian life is a life of confession, repentance, and faith. And so fundamentally, we as pastors need to be doing these things before we equip others, while we equip others, and after we equip others. This is, and I think this is this is coming back to this this present tense idea with this command, because the, the next command is just going to be an aorist, which will just be like a one time. This is this is ongoing. This is an ongoing past, before the entrusting, at and post. Okay. And so um, I can't stress that enough. Other things we can be doing, which is also fundamental to the, the 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 means of grace, is we can do. There should be there should be fellowship. Fellowship, where you can actually fellowship with people without a ministry agenda. And I've been in contexts where literally everything is ministry, and 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 the pastors and leaders can't function in just a fellowship context, and so. Fellowship, laughing, enjoying life, doing life together, that's fundamental to the Christian life, to the church. Christ is the center, but anything done as faith is holy. And so we need to have this fellowship aspect. Of course, 
worship as well. And so not only leading worship, but experiencing worship yourself, coming to church with this idea of, uh, of worship, that you're just not coming there to do a task. You're there to worship in the presence of Almighty God. And again, I don't want to stress one of the, I think these are all fundamental and I haven't mentioned them yet, but, but, but maybe we want to accent the absolute importance of prayer. This is connected with, especially here, and of course it occurs in worship, but we want to accent this idea of prayer, that prayer is by definition acknowledging that we are dependent upon Almighty God. And then two others here, experiencing and participating in Lord's Supper, and and also rest. And maybe maybe this is outside the technical means of grace. I think it's expansive. I think we can include it all. But but experiencing these things, not just ministering, but experiencing them. And so Joel Beakey will talk about the experiential pastor um, preaching and teaching. And so I think Paul, in a shorthand, is calling upon, and you'll see this throughout Timothy's the pastoral epistles. So I'm just highlighting here. Paul is calling upon Timothy to allow himself to be strengthened. And what does Paul have in mind when he says that? And, and, you'll, and you'll see it elsewhere in, in the pastoral epistles. I think all of these things, studying the word, um, living a life of faith, uh, worshiping, fellowshipping, prayer, Paul will, will, will call upon Timothy to dedicate himself to these activities. And so as pastors, as leaders, if we're going to be equipping in a missions context in a local church setting, what we need to be experiencing and doing every day is experiential shepherding. And of course, in Joel Beakey's context, I think it was more in a context of preaching. So this is not an either or, but they but they need to be they need to be together. And so big idea here that I think you should write down and consider is that before you can teach and lead others, you yourself must be experiencing the work of Christ. And so this this comes now down to what kind so what kind of grace we've really been accenting this 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 means of grace we have here a clarification slash description and this is that which comes in christ jesus and so there is so much going on here my goodness and so this is fundamentally living a life in union with Christ. And so fundamental to this is a life of faith and a life of gospel centeredness. All of the benefits of Christ are given to us living as if that's a reality. And all of our failures are given to Christ on the cross. In incredible. And so we could, we could say here things that, we, that, that are that are that we receive benefits to is number one fundamental to the Christian life. So this is in so this would be the context of the church, church context. And fundamental to this then would be the spirit, justification. We have sanctification, so being made holy. We have uh, eternal life, both now and forevermore, uh, in the eternal state. So there's there's so much like these are just bird's eye view items that there's just so much depth to. We have eternal life. We have we have sonship, and we have this incredible inheritance, eternal inheritance. I mean, there's just so much depth that we can go into there. But this is this is the things that have been giving to us. So, what kind of grace? Are we allowing to strengthen us this kind of grace? Fundamentally, the reality that we are in union with Christ. What type of strength, if we would allow the Spirit to fill us? Incredible. And so even the bigger, broader category beyond union with Christ, then, if we're thinking about combining, so we're combining here grace plus Christ. And I think the necessary implication here is the the covenant of grace is in view. And so this is mediated by Christ. And so we have all the promises, the promises to, A the Adam, the promises to Abraham, the promises given in the, 
in the old covenant as shadow and type pointing to the new covenant, the eternal substance and reality. And of course, all the promises given to David are now mediated and and given to us in Christ. And Christ is this, this comprehensive vision here. And so, so incredibly powerful. And we really see the, so, so as far as when it comes to, to training and equipping, just some, some points of application here. I do think that we can highlight some things when it comes to some application here. Number one, I, I do think missions work and we can tweak out details, but I do think fundamentally equipping equipping leaders needs to be done in a reformed Protestant confessional framework. You can disagree with that fair enough. People have different views of what that looks this looks like. But I think fundamentally that, you know, and maybe you don't want to use these terms, fine, but we're we're thinking about from a substance perspective substance i've highlighted a lot of things here and so this is i think this is this is this is fundamental and and so maybe you don't want to use the words but you can use the the terminology and and so when it comes to to preparing and equipping we need to be giving a depth of theology a depth of theology so in- incredible and a, and as a pushback on you know sometimes reformed is more dry that we need to have a living vibrant experiential ministry training ministry not that experience is guiding our our theology but that we're allowing our theology to guide our lives. Does everyone see that that tweak there? We're not saying that experience is a basis for our theology. We're saying that the experience flows from our theology, and we have to be experienced it before we can train and equip others. So much more that we could talk about concerning Christ and Jesus. I mean, so much more. You could, if if I was preaching this text, you could bring up the gospel. I'm going to bring it up at a later point, but you could also bring up the gospel here. So I'll just highlight here that this could be a place, a place to insert the gospel. Could be, could be. Um, we're, we're going to choose a different place here. Okay, so moving on here. So first thing, fundamental in response to Timothy's calling and the response of the gospel and the call to share in the suffering of the gospel, the ministry of the gospel, preaching the gospel, guarding the gospel in 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 the in in the context of apostates, the first response is not go do this, go equip a million leaders, you know, go the the the, the number one command and focus is you continue to be strengthened in the grace which is in Christ Jesus. We will never success be successful in ministry or in training or equipping at Cloud Seminary Plus if we are not fundamentally allowing ourselves to be strengthened by the the grace that is given to us in Christ. And and the the specific ways that we can engage in this fundamentally are word and sacraments, and specifically to to really tease that out, hearing the word reading the word, living a life of faith and dependence, confessing and repenting our sins on a daily basis to each other, fellowshipping with each other, experiencing communion as brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping, praying, experiencing and receiving from the benefits of Lord's Supper, and of course, rest. All of these, I think, are aspects um, of means of grace that we can experience. And I'm I'm looking more in the the comprehensive. There is you know teasing out what what the what the the fundamental activities are. So then we have next we've already highlighted. There's an and. So there's the there's there's while you're doing these things or after you you you're engaged in being strengthened, there's going to come a point in time where there's something that Paul wants Timothy to do in this in this struggle, and so. Let's first look here now at the accent. So coming back here, Paul will first give us the content 
He's going to highlight the content. What 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 type of content? And then he's going to give a command with relationship to the content of of the message. So here we have the the what. And so and so this what is really connected down here. The let's just let's just clearly draw this out so there's no confusion. This is the action moving to the object. And then this whole idea here is defining these things. I hope everyone's tracking there with me. And then the source of this is coming from Paul, which we've already accented in the previous video. I'll just re-highlight it here. This is the source. And then this is the, the means Oops, let's fix this here. And so with this hearing idea here, there's really three aspects that I want to highlight. What you have heard from me. Okay, so the, the hearer is Timothy. I'll just put Tim for sake of time. He's hearing something from Paul. And so this hearing really has three ideas here that are conveyed in hearing. So hearing, whether in Greek or it really in, in a biblical context, hearing comes from the, the Old Testament Shema. And, and Shema really means more that verb, whether it's a verb or it can also be converted into a noun, or there's a, I should say there's a noun form. It's a lot more than just hearing, right? So if I, if I have my daughter and I say, I tell her to go and clean her room, and she doesn't really go. And I, and I say, are you listening to me? Are you hearing me, Carmichael? The idea when I say hearing is so much more than just, did you literally hear the words that I said? The whole point is, have you heard it? Have you received it? Are you doing it? Okay. And so really this hearing here that Paul is calling upon Timothy to engage in, those things which you heard from me, this idea here is that of those things which he has received from Paul. And he has learned, and he's obeying. Okay, so he he is obeying them. That's really the three senses of this hearing. Okay, and so they're coming from Paul, and the means right is in the presence of many witnesses. So let's just highlight this, and we're going to really unpack the significance here. So number one, many. This is. This would be more than more than two. Okay, there's more than two. And what is this? This this witness. This is a technical word. You can kind of see the root that's going on here. Mart. Marturon. Marturon. So this is where we get, you know, martyr. And so in, in modern day, we would see martyr as someone who dies for Christ. But in the original context, martyr was was used. You can see that meaning here. Witness. This is in a legal, a legal context, legal context or courtroom setting. So, in the presence of many witnesses. So, if there's so there's other witnesses. That are actually, so let's just unpack this here. Let's let's bring this back up here. So with many witnesses, there's, we have here, if there's many witnesses going on, there is accountability, right? So, so Timothy can't just say whatever he wants. He can't pick and choose. There's other people that are going to hold him accountable to the message that he has been given. Number two. So there's accountability first to, to give what Paul has said. Number two, there is the call to give an act to be accurate in what is said. Number three, there is a defined content. So Timothy doesn't have the option to, okay, let's reduce this down. Let's make it simplistic because the people I'm working with now they just aren't there. They're not as gifted as I am or as gifted as Paul was. And so some of those challenging things in the Old Testament, the relationships of Old and New Testament, how law, gospel, 
what doctrine we're to believe, that divinity of Christ stuff and that that Trinitarian stuff, you know, that's really deep. We we can't, you know, I can't share that because people just Greeks, maybe Jews understand that, but Greeks don't understand that. This is really to push against that, to hold him accountable. And then we're going to go next level, and Paul's going to bring this up later. And I do think that this is in view. So, so coming over here, we have much. So let's look here at a very an incredibly strong text, Second Timothy four. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. So here, this is a parallel. There's a command. There's a there's a parallel idea here. Now, we'll tease out this entrusting verse here. We can see here the command is to preach. But here, the the, the courtroom setting is in view. So let's write this out here. So we have... Again, now this courtroom setting in 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 Timothy two, we have witnesses, and also now we have God and Christ, the judge. So this is second Timothy four one. All right, so this is incredibly powerful. Don't mess up the message, Timothy. What I gave you, you're you're going to entrust that to other men who can teach. But you can't reduce it. You can't change the message. What you've heard from me, you entrust to faithful men who can preach and teach. Accent on the teaching. Those things I've given you in, that I've given you in the presence of many witnesses later in in, in the in the letter in the very presence of God and Christ, the judge, my goodness. And so there is incredible accountability that's going on here in this work. Equipping and teaching in the church is not to be done lightly. So then moving on down here, let's focus on the, on the, the main action here. So we have the command in trust, right? In trust. And so Timothy is to entrust the these things. What things? Those things which you have heard from me. And so I've really written out. We can use examples here. So throughout Paul's letter to Timothy 1 and 2, there's really multiple items. What we'll do is I'll just first write them down, and then we can look at specific examples. So there's really, I see five things. There could be more or we could tweak out those, those things. Uh, let, let's write them out and then we'll highlight them. So, and we'll come back to the significance of entrust. Okay. But let's, let's first identify what those things are. And I think if we can identify those things, then we can really strongly, we can, we can better understand what entrust means. So if we can identify what these things are, I think the, the this idea of paratho, which is to entrust. I think we're going to see how strong a language that is. Several things. Number one, the word of God. And I would say that this is, this is all holy writings. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second to, to, to really see that in, in Paul's letters to Timothy. But I think so looking at the most comprehensive, what is entrusted with Timothy? Now, in one sense, this is also a this could also be a basis, or maybe it's how to handle this fair enough. But we want to we want to include that there is a set level number of documents, and that is what is to be entrusted because you are going to be teaching from a content. So perhaps this is the basis or the foundation. It's also the comprehensive, the comprehensive picture. Number two, we have interpretation. So we can clearly see now that inter interpretation is connected with number one. Okay, it's building upon. All right, so it's not mutually exclusive. It's the, it's the application of the word of God. And that's been entrusted to Timothy. And this is really where the teaching, teaching comes in. 
right? But even so, this is this would be method, whereas this is this is probably content. Memorizing the word of God, speaking the word of God, hearing the word of God, and then interpretation is teaching how to apply it, et cetera, et cetera. Number three, doctrine. So necessarily conclusions and truths in relationship to the word. So now we're building upon, we're building upon not just interpretation. This would be doctrine. And in, in Greek, this could also be teaching. So let's just look at a Greek, the Greek word here. If we go to uh, Timothy 4, 1, we have didaskalion, teaching or doctrine. Okay, so that's really, I think in King James, this this word is doctrine. So it's it's teaching. Okay, so and so this is this would be conclusions. Okay, so we would say in our contemporary term, this is systematic theology. And again, we're gonna we, you've just seen it right here in Second Timothy four one. We'll look back at First Timothy in a moment, and also to see that this is really in various places in the pastoral epistle. So, so it's 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 more than than just my inference for what these things are. Secondly, you can clearly see that it's much more than just a simple stories or just fundamentally the gospel. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to where the gospel is so central um, in this these things. Okay, so I, we don't want to minimize the God. We want to accent the gospel. But at the same time, it's much more than that, and and this really pushes against people that say we shouldn't go deep or just 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 keep to just keep to some of the the, the, the most fundamental and those peripheral things we shouldn't really we shouldn't really talk about or it's don't go deep right all those different things they don't understand uh, we're really going to see that that's just not the case here. So the next the next thing then we we see here and and again you're going to see this throughout throughout Paul and maybe this is the application as well but the law of God. What God demands of the world and of his church and people within the church. Okay, so again, it's not an either or. So these are all interrelated, but we're drawing out specific aspects that we need to be teaching and entrusting and calling upon people to, to teach and preach themselves. And you'll see this in churches. Some churches, they just emphasize law. Some churches, they just emphasize. They're very big on law and commandments. They're very, they're very big on grace and <laughs> and and love and it's not an either or it's a both and I, I hope that we're i hope that we're seeing that here and then number five and lastly we have of course most fundamental and being accented is the gospel so this is not an either or it's it's five okay now maybe we want to see others fair enough let's let's think about that and so the comprehensive idea here that i want us to see is ministry of ministry of the word. All right, ministry of the word. Okay, so let's just highlight really briefly here. Let's look for these words. Let's look at these words throughout. And specifically, we're going to look specifically at just... Timothy's epistle. So what I want to do here is I want to change this range. I'm going to change this to define a range. And so if you have, we're going to add a new one. And so we're going to add pastoral epistle. So if, if you're, if you're using accordance, we recommend accordance, accordance and step Bible, you can follow along. So we're going to include in this range, Timothy, Uh, Timothy to Titus. Let's do first Timothy to Titus. Let's see what we get here. Verify. Okay, so we're going to do update. All right, so we got it there. So this should be good. So now we can look at the pastoral epistles. Maybe you just you just want to see first and second Timothy. Fair enough, because for sure, you know, maybe maybe Timothy never got Titus. The epistle to Titus, but he definitely got First Timothy first. So we can and we can we can tweak that out. So let's go ahead and let us let us search. The first word we're going to search is Word of God, Word of God, and let's search that. And so now, right now, we're just in the pastoral epistles. And so here, 
1 Timothy 4, 5, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. 2 Timothy 2, 9, for which I am suffering, bound as a criminal, the word of God is not bound. So there, probably that context is more in a gospel sense, but it is it is it is that general statement. So I, I do think that there is this comprehensive view of what God has revealed to us. And then 2 Timothy 2, 5, be self-controlled, pure, working at home submissive to their own husbands. So this is d- describing qualifications of, I think that's elders, elders, pa- elders, deacons, but that the word of God might be revived. So there's this category that Paul has in mind. And I think, so this is these things we could search instead of let's, let's search now writings. Let's change this word to writings. And so, or let's change this to, let's change this to graph a. Can we do that? So we're looking at graph A, writing our documents. If we search that, there's two examples here. Okay, so let us change this to now to, let's put this over here and let's switch this to ESV. So so here we have, really we can just X this out for right now. So here we have, for the scripture says, the writings, the writing says all scripture is breathed out by God. Okay. So looking at this, this pie chart, we can look at the analytics, but at least we, so at least we know that that's a category that Paul wants, that, that it's, 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 it's a category in the, the pastoral epistles. And it's something fundamental. We see here that it's all scripture. So it's fundamental, just, just a chapter later. So I think that we are this is fair to include what Paul has in mind here is in entrusting these things. Because, uh, one, the first thing that's to be entrusted is the word of God or all the holy writings. And so we would include um, OT and NT comprehensively. And, and we can discuss describing why we can appropriately include that is just beyond the scope of this. We just should, we just should accept at this point because we're not really focusing on, you know, all those nuances it's, it's there. And we could defend that much uh, in, in, on a stronger basis if, if we had to. So then we have this idea of interpretation. And so let's let's just go to one example so that we know what's going on here. So if we were to go now to back up to here, let's go to 1 Timothy 1. 1 Timothy 1. There is an issue in chapter 1. So let's let's scroll up here. So here we have in, in, in 1 Timothy 1, a major issue here. So we have an, an issue with certain persons are teaching different doctrine. Okay, so this is their teaching false doctrine. Okay, so we have this idea, what we've talked, we brought up. So really we have here the, the teaching and also a different doctrine. And doctrine probably is, is teaching or we could say a different tradition. These are all words used throughout Paul's epistle epistles and so they're they're appropriate. So they're teaching a different doctrine desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or things about which they make confident assertions. We know the law is good if used lawfully. So these are teachers of the law. Okay? So this is this would be and they're saying certain things, right? So this is really concerning interpretation of the law and also dealing with the law, right? So those are two aspects that we highlighted in these things. And so I think I think that's fundamental, okay? And then Paul talks about we know the law is good if used lawfully. So this really is handling the law as a challenge, both the content and, and its interpretation. Okay, and so uh, contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of glory, which I have been entrusted. So let's take a peek here. Let's look at this. Let's look at First Timothy. And so Second Timothy builds on First Timothy. And if these are parallel, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say here is that is that. All of the content that Paul is teaching, there are these different aspects in relationship to the Word of God, different different nuances, different parts. 
And Paul is entrusting all of it to Timothy. So let's just look here. Let's confirm that it's the same word being used. So if we come down here to verse 11, uh, the same words that are being used here in, in other places in Paul, we have uh, nama didaskaloi, nama didaskaloi, which is teachers of the law, literally. And then coming down here to, to verse 11, didaskalie. And then coming down to here, we have um, the gospel, according to the gospel, which has been entrusted to me. Okay, so entrusted is given. Um, there you see how strong it is. The root is coming from pistuo, given to him by God himself. And so perhaps that's a cognate of paratithemi, paratithemi, I'm sorry, paratithemi. But, but there is this idea of entrustment. All right, and so even if it's not the exact same word used, we have a synonym of being entrusted with something. And so now Paul is going to be in, is going to be giving it, entrusting it and giving it to Timothy. And probably there's a different level. This is next level because the Lord God, Jesus, by the will of God, entrusted it to Paul. So this probably is, is next level here, okay? And we have law, sound doctrine, or just teaching, which is what doctrine is, conclusions. We have gospel and we have this in trust. So I think this is a very fair and parallel context to what we're looking at. So we can look at here of, in a parallel context, we have Second Timothy 3.16. We have here First Timothy one, three to 11, really, really in view here, these things. Okay. And then gospel is just, let's do a word search of gospel. Let's see how strong this is. This could be, this could be crazy here. Here we go. So let's just do first good news, search command, or we could do Galizo, so we we can do you 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 Yuang Gelian, Yuang Gelian, or Yuang Galizo. So this is the verb to 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 preach, to proclaim the good news. This is the noun, good news or gospel. Okay, so let's search this bad boy. Come on, let's do it. So we have gospel showing up in in. Timothy 1.11, according to the gospel, 1 Timothy 1.11, we just looked at that context. 2 Timothy 1.8, he is not ashamed of the gospel. 2 Timothy 1.10, through the gospel. And 2 Timothy 2.8, in my gospel. So there is, there is a cluster of, let's look here at the, let's look at the, the bar chart here. Hits graph. There we go. Okay, so minus. Okay, so you can see here we're looking at a hits chart of the use of gospel. Okay, so in First Timothy, there's one use here. In Second Timothy, there's a cluster of usages. So there's three, um, one, two, three. There's three usages. There's three usage, three three times it's used in Second Timothy. So really, we see a cluster, and it's right around, it's right around our passage of Second Timothy two one. So that's incredibly powerful. So let me go ahead and let me just keep this. So this is why we're really accenting. So th so let's just write these down here. So there is an accent on the gospel in Second Timothy one to two. Okay. And so if you were interpreting this and you just want to see the gospel that's being entrusted, you could you could make a case for that. I do think it's deficient. I don't think it's including everything, especially with especially with the presence of the false teachers in the preceding context. I do think that this all of these nuances we should be including and thinking, especially in view of those things which you heard from me. Because what have you heard from me? What you've heard from me for sure we could say is from is the content of first Timothy and now second Timothy. Okay, so I do think 
there's probably much more that Paul said. I think those were the accents. That's what Paul really wanted to, to know. And it wouldn't, it, so, so, so of course it wouldn't, it wouldn't deny Paul's interpretation of old and new Testament. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so, so it's a lot more. I think that this is really, really fair. But the significance for us is we can't short circuit this. We can't shorten the content. We can't reduce it to to fit our needs. We have to take time and we have to focus on it. And we have to make sure that we're in, we're. So what do we have to focus on? What we're doing? Okay. So this is where it comes into view here of this idea of entrusting. So let's come back here now to Second Timothy two, and we're going to look at this word Second Timothy two entrusting. So we're going to look up this word here, parato, coming from the, the full word, not in its specific form in the context, is paratithemi, paratithemi. So let's look this up in a dictionary. Let's blow this up here for a moment. And so this is to place before something, to set before in teaching. And so this here, I think, is really the third nuance, which we need to focus upon. To entrust for safekeeping. I think this is, that is it right there. And you actually have that literally BDAG, liberal, liberal lexicon. And when I say liberal, they're just, they, they do not take a high view of scripture, but they recognize that this context is clearly this idea of entrusting for sake, for safekeeping. And so there's multiple nuances here that I want to accent. And again, I'm drawing upon this, not from just my opinion, but from studying the pastoral epistles. So let's look here now at what is being accented. So what I'd say here is this entrusting, other words, the idea of what entrust encapsulates in both a Greek context, fundamentally in a Paul context. So Paul's context defines what entrust means. So if we're looking throughout, if you read carefully the pastoral epistles, and especially 1 Timothy 1 and 2, what we can say here are several things. In defining entrust, number one, protect or guard. Number two, preserve. So in protecting and guarding, you're you're changing, you're change, you're 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 guarding against the changing of the meaning. In preserving, you're you're you have this idea of keeping it alive, keeping it real. Okay. And then number three, we have this idea of proclamation. Part of entrustment fundamental to Paul's ministry was the teaching and the proclamation to other people. So really here, you have guard, preserve, and proclaim. All right? And so then combining these two, we have the emphasis upon ministry of the word. OK, the ministry of the word is much more than just teaching. It's much more than preaching. It's teaching and preaching. It's concerning all of the content, interpretation, the conclusions, the law of God, and, and most fundamentally, the gospel, the incredible news. And so what is the gospel? Here now, the proclamation of the gospel I'm going to read from First Timothy one eight, there's more that we could add to this, and 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 Paul says it several times here. It's describing the work of Christ. So incredibly powerful for us to consider the actual content. What is the gospel here now? The proclamation of the gospel. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Description: Who saved us and called us by a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. My goodness, reformed, reformed baby all the way. But now has been manifested through the appearing of our Lord and Savior, our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death, the curse of Adam, and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed preacher, apostle, and teacher. So, obviously, this is a description of God. Fair enough. But in describing God, the content of God's work 
is the good news. Undoing curse, the curse of death, giving us life, saving us through Christ. Is this not the covenant of grace? God's plan in Christ to redeem a people for himself, giving that people all the benefits that Christ earns, the merit of Christ, and all of our failures, our sin, the guilt of Adam, the sin nature, the guilt of our personal sins are all placed upon Jesus Christ. And so this is the gospel, my friends. And by faith in Christ, we have redemption, salvation, eternal life. And so this is what Paul is entrusting to Timothy and calling upon him to guard. Most fundamental, the gospel, most comprehensive, the word of God, the ministry of the word. But if ever Paul was a narcissist, if ever Timothy was a narcissist, the antidote is to entrust it to others. In a missions context, we as the missionary, we as the pastor, we are not lone wolves. We're not popish. We're not from the Catholic Church. We are to, to equip in, in the plurality of elders. And so look at who is to receive this. Look who is to receive this. Several descriptions here. Number one, faithful men. So, so let's let's just let's come back here. So, number one, men. This is plural, and this is complementarian. People will, of course, say that oh, this is the patriarchy, and really, this could be women as well. And Paul allows for women to teach women. Okay, so this is not this is not that women can never ever speak, but this is in the context of the ministry of the word. Um, and so we talk about, we can talk about ordination to gospel ministry. And so this is fundamentally, though, complementarian and it's plurality. Okay. Plurality of, 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 of elders and it's complementarian. Those who are entrusted with the teaching, the ministry of the word. Okay. But it's not, if ever there was this pushback against this multiplication, just send a bunch of men, we'll equip them as they go. Look at this here now. Number four, faithful men. These are already proven, already proven men. We choose and train and equip those that already, in, in other places in, in Paul's epistles, we can look at 1 Timothy 3. This is blameless. Blameless, okay? And then if ever it's just blameless men, Morality of men, but that's it. There is a third, uh, uh, I guess this is a fifth qualification here. A fifth qualification. And this is incredibly powerful. This is incredibly powerful here. Okay. This, uh, this, uh, this, chakanoi, chakanoi, this is ability. What kind of ability do these men have to have? They have to be able to teach others. Teaching. Some men do not have the gift of teaching. And so when it comes to fundamentally gospel ministry, that doesn't mean God gives different gifts in the church. That doesn't mean to be little. But some men are not gift, gifted with the gift of teaching. And so we as leaders need to be identifying those who are gifted and those who are not. And those who are not gifted, we should not be teaching. Not that there isn't another place for them to have, not that they can't lead. There's ruling elders, there's teaching elders, there's different types of leadership in the church, there's evangelists. We can talk about all those different things. But fundamentally, the, 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 the ministry of the word has to be given to number one, men, number two, a plurality. So it's entrusted to more than one. Number three, faithful. I guess I have a, a duplicate there. So 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 it should be it should be four, not five. So I apologize for that. So men, plurality. They must already be faithful. And number four, they must have the ability to teach. And then you are to entrust it to them. And so in, in Cloud Seminary, our vision is to our vision is to partner with churches and equip leaders to then do the work of the ministry. We're partnering with local lo, the local church. We are situated in a local church in the US, and we're we're looking to train faithful men 
to teach that have the ability to teach and then we send them once they are once they are trained we're not sending them out and equipping them while they go we we equip them we identify the faithful ones first the ones that are that are mature and faithful we equip them and then we send and this will save we can talk about pragmatic benefits and benefits within the church but fundamentally it's what's what's the word of god has commanded us okay and so incredibly important incredibly strong so looking at here we have we have here the the chain the chain or pattern for teaching let's let's write this chain this for the ministry of the word we have paul I actually missed this. This so this is really powerful. So let's be clear. So we have, we have, we have Christ. Then we have Christ entrusted entrusted to Paul, and this is by the will of God. Then we have Paul entrusting it to Timothy, and then we have Timothy entrusting it to faithful, able men who will teach. And so this is really, this is really the pattern, and this is and this is all done in the church. So this is training in the church. This is equipping in the church. Uh, incredibly powerful. Incredibly strong. Okay. And so let's let's get to an an uh, a um, an exegetical outline and then big idea here. Big idea here. Okay. So let's. Let's come back to here. And so this 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 uh this the training chain we really should include. <laughs> Refer to the other diagram. I'll I'll update this because really um this was this was as I was preparing. And so we want to include Christ here. We want to include the will of God as well. So uh so we we'll update this this handout. The other thing I want to update as well is this is also a this is also a command. So um we just want to accent that. So there's the there's the the command, the comprehensive command to equip leaders. That's the big idea that's being taught in 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 Second uh, Timothy one one to two, and then the first part is is the command to be completely dependent upon Christ. So that's the first, and then there is the command to entrust. And what are we entrusting? The ministry of the word. You don't want to unpack all of that, and then. We would, um, who is the one receiving it? The type of men um, that we are to select. And then the goal, the goal is for teaching. Teaching in the church. And so the big idea, the big idea for this workshop, homiletical, this will preach. The big idea for this workshop and the big idea for Cloud Seminary Plus is we must entrust the ministry of the word to others by first being dependent on Christ, knowing its content, then entrusting it to, to faithful, capable men who will teach their people. And so this here for Cloud Seminary Plus is in the context of missions. Okay? And so there is a clear chain and progression in how we equip. We don't, we don't, so, so practically speaking here, let's come back to our breakout section and discuss, okay? So, so I think we can say clearly and strongly, lowering the bar, we should not be doing. We should be pushing. We should be pushing for deep theology and solid doctrine. I don't think we should be equipping while sending. I do think that we should, we should equip, prepare, confirm, and then send. I think that this is biblical. And what which what should we be, we should be focusing upon? Even Paul says in First Timothy, "Don't be hasty, lay lay hands on on novices." Okay, and so and everyone has a story of someone who was sent and then equipped while they were sent, lasted in in terrible ca catastrophe. We we should be accenting the Great Commission's call, so we should be seeking to fulfill the Great Commission. I'm fine with multiplication movements if we define it fundamentally like this. And so the analogy that I'm going to come back to is Toyota. Toyota 
for vehicles and Honda for power products. These are two of the greatest um, companies in the world. Incredible equipment. I have, I've had both equipment. Love their equipment and technology. They are not the greatest because they have awesome gimmicks. They are not the greatest because they have awesome they have awesome uh, advertising. They're not the greatest because they have the greatest mobile mobilization efforts. They are the greatest because they have the greatest and th they have the best quality. They st withstand the test of time. Someone knows if we buy a Toyota or a Honda, we know what we're going to get. And so what I would argue is apply their method in training men and women. It's going to be slow at first. It's not going to seem like we're multiplying, but in the long run, we will be multiplying. Toyota, Honda, I, you, you, go over, you go overseas and try to buy a Honda generator. They're out of stock, right? You try to buy, buy a Toyota vehicle, there's a, there's a waiting list. You try to buy a Toyota pickup truck, and like they're, they're, they're the most expensive when it comes to resale value. Not because of their gimmicks, not because they're awesome at multiplication and, and advertising. They're, they're, they're sold out. Because of the quality, and we at Cloud Seminary want to. We want to. We this is the, this is the way that we see movements multiply uh, biblically, and we want to be a part of that. And so, I hope this workshop has been a blessing for you as pastors, as leaders. Number one, you must be experiencing daily and allowing yourself to be strengthened by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Christ, through the means of grace experience it and then you need to receive you need to hear receive learn apply and then as you're doing ministry you identify different men that are capable that are faithful that are men to lead in the ministry of the word that doesn't mean there isn't a place for women but fundamentally in the leadership role in the ministry of the word in the technical sense in ordination it is for men you identify those men and you entrust them with the word of God. You entrust them with the word, the interpretation, right doctrine, deep doctrine, but it has to be practical. And most fundamentally, the gospel, our only hope in this dying, curse-filled universe. And so this is the vision of Cloud Seminary. And so I'm going to come back in closing. We must entrust the ministry of the word to others by first being dependent on Christ, knowing its content, and then entrusting it to faithful, capable men who will teach their people. Let us close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this time and for the power of technology. Father God, we are sinners. As, as, as leaders, we are called to this high task we're called to be blameless and holy, but we want to confess to you that we are not perfect. We're far from perfect. We want to depend upon you. We ask forgiveness for our sins. Father God, may you give us the strength to, to, to keep the ministry of the word, to guard it, to protect it, to proclaim it. And Father God, may we entrust it to faithful men who will be able to teach others, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's in Asia, Africa, South America, Europe, Father God, Australia, may we embrace and submit to these truths and, and, and not allow our pragmatics or our feeling or emotions control us. Now may the love of the Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen, and go in peace.